Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us tonight. Welcome to tonight's virtual Civil War program brought to you by CivilWarTalk.com. Thank you for joining us. Tonight's guest is John V. Corstein, author of 19 books, including the CSS Virginia Saint Before Surrender. This series is provided by CivilWarTalk.com, the American Civil War Discussion Forum. We're pleased to be able to bring these fantastic authors and programs to you live via the virtual platform. If you aren't already a member of Civil War Talk, we'll be providing membership information later in the program, and I hope you'll all join the Civil War Talk community. If you're the author of a great Civil War book or a battlefield guide or researcher or collector, and you have a story to tell, we'd love to speak with you about providing a presentation like this one. Tonight, if you're concerned about a Zoom presentation and think it might be more than you can handle, perhaps a book launch at civilwartalk.com. We can also partner with you to execute a great social media pro campaign to go along with your book launch. Um, so schedule that book launch today at civilwartalk.com. Our guest tonight is John V. Corstein. Mr. Corstein is an award-winning historian, preservationist, and author. He is Director Emeritus of the USS Monitor Center at the Marinas Museum and Park in, New in Newport News, Virginia. The author of 19 books, his The Monitor Boys, the crew of the Union's first ironclad won the 2012 Henry Adams Prize for Excellence in Historical Literature. Corstein has produced, narrated, and written six PBS documentaries, including the Silver Telly Award series, The Civil War in Hampton Roads. He is the recipient of the 1996 President's Award from the National Trust for Historic Preservation. Corstein lives in the National Register of Historic Places property, the 1757 Herbert House. This outstanding example of brick Georgian architecture is located near Blackbird, Blackbeard's Point on the Hampton River in Hampton, Virginia. Tonight, Mr. Querstein's presentation will focus on the makeshift warship SS Virginia Merrimack when she slowly steamed down the Elizabeth River toward Hampton Roads on March 8, 1862. The tide of naval warfare turned from wooden sailing ships to armored steam-powered vessels. Little did the ironclads crew realize that they would achieve the greatest Confederate naval victory. In his book, The CSS Virginia, Sink Before Surrender, Corstein recounts the compelling story of this ironclad underdog providing detailed appendices, including crew member biographies and a complete chronology of the ship and crew. Please join me in welcoming Mr. John V. Corstein. Hello, everyone. Uh, <clears throat> I'm uh, John uh, V. Corstein. I'm Director Emeritus of the USS Monitor Center at the Mariners Museum and Park. And it's really my pleasure uh, to be with you all today to talk about one of my favorite topics. Obviously, uh, I like to monitor as well, but I also uh, really, when I grew up, I grew up looking out on the battlefield <clears throat> and uh, where the Monitor, the Virginia, um, actually dueled um, near Newport News Point. So that began my interest. I wanted to be a historian and a uh, author and a preservationist since I was about eight years old. And so 60 years later, uh, here I am. So let's get into our story. You know, I have to tell you that a uh, little after one o'clock, uh, on March 8, 1862, um, the CSS Virginia is going to move down the Elizabeth River and enter in to Hampton Roads and change naval warfare forever. Of course, um, to learn about it, first we got to remember where this ship came from. And it was actually a ship launched in 1857 known as the USS Merrimack. Now, just a little lesson for you all. The Merrimack is named for the Merrimack River in New Hampshire, and so it should always be spelled with a K at the end, the USS Merrimack with a K. Remember that now, because if you spell it with just a C, that means you're from Massachusetts. And, you know, Franklin Pierce, who signed the bill, filled the ship 
was actually from Merrimack County, New Hampshire. So there you have it. Uh, I guess so that's one question answered. So uh, what we um, realize is that the Merrimack will be launched in 1857. She's called a novel example of naval architecture. However, during our first voyage, her engines break down, they become a major problem. Furthermore, when this ship was designed, you see, we're at a transition period right now between sail and steam. So they wanted our new warships ever since we uh, built the uh, Fulton II and the USS Mississippi. We wanted our ships to be powered partially by steam, but for economy's sake, uh, also with sails. So John Lentall, who designed this ship, will create a very sheer hull that makes it a great sailor, but in rough seas, she rolled so badly that um, you could not uh, fire your guns. That's one problem. Number two, the uh, uh, I would have to say the engine system is, is really underpowered. Um, it is, uh, has, has several problems. Uh, number one, um, it's transmission or it's um, drive shaft slips a lot. So it loses about um, a quarter of its power by the time it gets to the propeller. And so this ship was really designed to be a sailor though because they have a, what is that called a banjo device where they can lift the propeller out of the water when, so it's no longer dragging when the ship's operating under sail. And furthermore, will they have this little um, place where they can stick the, uh, uh, attach the, the propeller so that uh, it stays in place. It's a twin bladed propeller. Uh, and so it's, the, it's just not a good engine system. And so it will go on several cruises, goes to Europe. Everyone goes, oh my gosh, this is the future of naval architecture. And then it will actually have serious problems with her engines. And as a result of that, change slide, please. Uh, as a result of that, uh, we um, uh, recognize that, and there are all these people who are on board it, like Kate V. App, Roger Jones, he says it's a bad platform. This is a view of the um, and so and I'll get to explain that. So what happens, the engines are condemned and the USS Merrimack will be sent to Gosport Navy Yard up the Elizabeth River, right across the river from Norfolk in Portsmouth, Virginia. And there it will be placed in what we call ordinary, uh, mothballed one might say, uh, but the, the Gosport, there were 14 other ships that were uh, also mothballed. In fact, there was a section of the yard that was called Rotten Row, where they had several ships like the Raritan, the USS Pennsylvania, which is a 140 gun sailing ship of the line. That thing was stuck in the mud and was used as a receiving ship. They had several in ship houses that were partially built. So what's gonna happen is, of course, storm clouds are gonna come over the nation. And that's those storm clouds are gonna be actually the Civil War. And Virginia stays loyal to the Union until uh, the bombardment of Fort Sumter. And with the bombardment of Fort Sumter, um, Abraham Lincoln then calls for volunteers, 75,000 volunteers for states loyal to the Union. Governor John Letcher says, we refuse to be used to rehearse our sister southern states. Virginia is out of the Union. Well, Virginia at that time has some powerful military resources. Harper's Ferry Arsenal, Fort Monroe, Virginia, which is the largest moat encircled stone fortification in uh, North America. And then it has Gosport Navy Yard, which is the leading Navy Yard in the United States. It's got a granite dry dock. It's got its own foundry. Uh, it has um, uh, just a tremendous array of equipment and supplies that could maintain any type of well, the trouble is that the Gunsport Navy Yard um, 
when Virginia leaves the Union, is commanded by a guy known as Flag Officer Charles Stuart Macaulay. And Macaulay um, is 67 years old. He's been in the U.S. Navy for uh, 52 years. Some people say he's gotten a little too old for service. Everyone all agrees. He just drinks too much. So here he's in command of this important shipbuilding facility. Gideon Wells, Secretary of the Navy for the Union, sends a telegram down. You must do everything you can to defend the yard. You must do everything you can to defend the honor of the nation. You must do everything you can to get the Merrimack ready for sea. You need to do all these things, but do not anger the Virginians. I leave it all to your discretion. Well, you know, if you're drunk, sometimes you don't have that much discretion. And so uh, the Merrimack has gotten ready for sea, but he refuses to release it. Uh, a task force is sent from Washington down towards Gosport Navy Yard, commanded by Flag Officer Hiram Paulding. However, I have to tell you, it will arrive too late because um, Macaulay, he thinks he's surrounded by all these Confederates. The Confederates are running trains into the town, huzzahing and so forth, making it think there are more and more troops. Fort Norfolk across the river, containing 300,000 pounds of gunpowder captured by the Confederates. So Macaulay, on the afternoon of April 20th, 1861, will abandon the yard, set it on fire, all the ships throughout the uh, yard are set afire, including the USS New York, a 72-gun ship of the line. Um, the USS United States is not burned, neither um, is the Cumberland, which is actually going to be able to leave uh, under tow. But I'm going to tell you that uh, Macaulay burns all these ships. The Merrimack, as we see right there, when they set her afire, they also pull her seacock. So the big question is, how well does a sinking ship sink when it's burning? You know, how, how well does it burn? Not well at all. So the Confederates will raise the ship and they cut her down to her birth deck and remove the mass and everything. And the engine, they will rework under the guidance of William Price Williamson, as well as Ashton Ramsey. What to do with the ship, slide please. What to do with this ship is going to be amazing. This is showing the destruction of the Navy Yard. That is actually the Merrimack right in front of you, center of the um, screen. The US Navy only had 28 steam-powered warships. So that was a very important ship to enforce the blockade. Well, the next day after the burning, the Confederates come into Gosport Navy Yard, and within there, they find the wherewithal to build a Navy because the retreating Confederate Federals do not blow up the granite dry dock. They don't blow up the foundry. They don't actually destroy all the cannons right, that are along the key. In fact, one of those cannons, a nine-inch Dahlgren, is on display in the Mariner's Museum, and it shows where they took sledgehammers trying to break off the trunnions, and it just didn't work. Slide, please. So the Merrimack is raised and placed into dry dock number one and will be transformed. Now, there's a team of people. You see, the Secretary of Navy for the Confederacy, uh, a, man, a man known as Stephen Russell Mallory, uh, a really great guy, jolly, um, ruddy cheeks, uh, um, kind of roly-poly figure. Every morning he woke up and had oysters and champagne to start his day. So he's my kind of guy. Uh, I learned about that. That made me do that. But anyway, another story. Uh, so the bottom line is, is that he said the Confederacy cannot outbuild the U.S. Navy, that the Confederacy must build ships heretofore never seen in naval warfare. They must be armed with rifle cannon. They must be iron-plated, steam-powered, and fitted with rain. And so this concept will be developed into reality uh, by John Mercer Brook and the naval constructor, John Luke Porter. Now, 
Brooke and Porter hate each other, so, you know, it's kind of a rough team. But nevertheless, um, they're able to raise the Merrimack, place it into dry dock, and then begin its transformation. Number one, they got to work on those engines. Number two, the only place they could get the right iron plate was from Tredegar Ironworks in Richmond, Virginia. Now, uh, KHP app Roger Jones and John Mercer Book did some tests on Jamestown Islands about iron and found that you had to have two layers of two inch iron plate not to have the plate penetrated. So, the Virginia is casemate, which runs 170 feet down the vessel. Uh, actually, uh, the vessel is um, basically, uh, when it goes into service, it is virtually submerged. All you really see is that casemate. And that's the way the Confederates wanted it. So they actually had to build a, a bulk word of wood. So the casemate is going to be built out of 24 inches of yellow pine, white pine, and live oak, topped by two layers of two inch iron plate. Then they have to arm this ship. Now I gotta tell you, um, the forward port, actually there are three ports there, and that would house a seven inch brook gun on a pivot mount. So it used three different um, uh, ports to fire. Then going down the vessel, the next gun port would house a 6.4 inch Brook rifled gun. Brook had developed these concepts of rifling. Actually, his rifling guns were better than any others during the Civil War. So then uh, there are three more gun ports and they'll be filled with nine inch Dahlgren shell guns. And then the rear or stern port would have a seven inch book gun also on a pivot mount. Oh my gosh, this ship is a death knell for wooden warships. And notice that ram. Oh my gosh, that is going to be suggested by John Mercer Brooke. And Porter said, ah, we don't need it. And Brooke said, yes, we do. We're going to have it. So it's 1,500 pound cast iron that's fitted on to the bow of the vessel using bolts. Well, when they mount it, they actually crack the ram, but Porter doesn't care because he doesn't believe in the ram. So what happens? Slowly but surely, the ship is brought together. And on February 17, 1862, the ship will be launched, christened, and commissioned all at once and it will be called the CSS Virginia. That's her name. Uh, that <coughs> they like to call it the Virginia because they say it's built in Virginia, a Virginia iron and wood, and in Virginia waters changed history. Oh wow. So now they need to have slide please. Now they need to have a commander. And you can see how low in the water this ship is. Um, and uh, Waterline, actually, uh, um, John Luke Porter misjudged uh, the um, weight of the ship. And so actually they had to put what's called ketledge or iron bars to lower it in the water because there's not an armor belt below the waterline. Oh my gosh. So the iron comes down to the ship's knuckle and that's it. So um, they have to put that on. Slide please then they are going to have to figure out who is going to take command of this ship. And his name is going to be, uh, Frank. there he is, Franklin Buchanan. Let me tell you, he's born in Baltimore, Maryland on September 17, 1800. His grandfather was a signer of the Declaration of Independence. His father was the founder of the Maryland Medical Society. He joins the Navy at age 15. Um, he will end up being uh, an outstanding officer. Um, he will be the first superintendent of the United States Naval Academy at Annapolis. He fights during the Mexican War. Uh, he goes with Matthew Galbraith Perry as Perry's flag captain 
first on board the USS Mississippi, uh, then on board the USS Susquehanna. They go out and they open the door to where? Japan. So Buchanan is there. In fact, it said that he is the first officer to step foot on Japanese soil. Oh my gosh. So what happens is, you know, he's from Maryland and he marries into a prominent um, so, uh, Maryland um, family. Uh, the, uh, so what will happen is, is that he's pro-Maryland. And of course, if you know at the beginning of the war, Maryland is teetering on whether to leave or not leave. So as a result of that, when um, Buchanan learns about the Baltimore riot on April 19, 1861, he will resign his mission. And then all of a sudden, what happens? Maryland doesn't leave the Union. So he sends a letter to Gideon Wells says, uh, you know, I was a little hasty in my decision. Can I get my job back? You know, he was then commander of the Washington Navy Yard. And Gideon Wells writes across the letter, you are a traitor. You're dismissed from the service. Buchanan now is like a football free agent. So he joins the Confederate Navy first head of the Office of Orders and Details. In other words, he's sending people to be on different ships. So he makes sure while he's in that position that the Virginia will get some of the finest officers available in the Confederacy. Kate Spiap, Roger Jones, the executive officer, Lieutenant John Taylor Wood, grandson of Zachary Taylor, uh, John Randolph Eggleston. The list goes on. These are just you know, former naval officers. So Buchanan will try to rush the ship into action. He actually, um, now I gotta tell you, there's no secrets during the Civil War. And I'll just use this example. Um, you know, the Lynchburg Virginian wrote about the, uh, when the capture of Gosport Navy Yard said, you know, yay, we have captured this yard and we can build a fleet of ironclads. Well, the Federals go, oh my gosh. And so that makes them start their ironclad board, which I'll get to in due course. Then what's going to happen is that, uh, um, so Buchanan knows the Federal are doing ironclads. In fact, he knows the very day the Monitor leaves New York because it's published in the New York Times and uh, then you monitor, ironclad monitor leaves New York Harbor, destination, Hampton Roads. Oh my gosh, Confederate agents, you know, this story. So he's in a rush. However, a terrible storm will come through Hampton Roads. The Virginia uh, has 790 tons of iron on top of it, okay? So with that sheer haul, some people fear that they have conproquitted the vessel with such weight. Buchanan knows he has to ha have beautiful, um, perfect weather conditions. So on the morning of March 8th, 1862, the, the day blooms just like any other uh, wonderful day in spring in Virginia. Not a, a cloud in the sky, not a ripple in Hampton Roads, and Buchanan is now ready to take a ship on its, uh, what is called a shakedown cruise. Shakedown cruise, you, know, you take your ship out, you figure it out, what's wrong, what's right, then you bring it back, fix some things, and then you're ready to fight. Well, Buchanan has other ideas. Around 12 o'clock, they uh, slip away from the key at Gosport Navy Yard. Thousands of people are lining the riverbank, cheering. One person yelled uh, to Harden Little Page, go on with your metallic coffin. You'll never amount for a thing. Well, as the Virginia guts right to the mouth of the Elizabeth River next to Sewell's Point in Crane Island, uh, we can have a new slide, please. Uh, what will happen is, uh, yay, a ship, of course, Cannon, as they, they, they reach this point, he calls as many of his men onto the gun deck, and he gives them this great passionate speech. Uh, men, we are here to do our duty, not just our duty, but more than our duty. And he points out to Hampton Roads. Those ships must be taken. There are five major Union warships in Hampton Roads that day. 
okay? The uh, 47 gun Minnesota uh, steam screw frigate, the steam 42 gun steam crew screw frigate, the Roanoke, the 52 gun sailing frigate, the St. Lawrence, the uh, Brazil um, Sloop of War, the Cumberland with 24 guns. Oh my gosh. And then there's the old Congress that has 50 guns. So there are all those guns. It became just a 10 gun. So he says, men, those ships must be taken. Some of you all have complained. I have not taken you close to the enemy. I will take you there now. To your cannons, to your death. We will sink before surrender. You can imagine the crew. What? You know, in fact, one of the surgeons goes up to Buchanan and says, um, you know, I thought this was, uh, we were testing the vessel, uh, uh, our ship is on try. And Buchanan looks at him and says, if we sink the enemy fleet, we know our ship is a success. If they sink us, we're indeed a failure. Boom, like that, it enters into Hampton Roads. One of the uh, lookouts on board, the Minnesota, will see what looked like a floating barn roof with a chimney belching smoke come into Hampton Roads. Oh my gosh, it's got to stick into the channel. Virginia has a draft of 22 feet. So it can't go anywhere it wants in Hampton Roads. It's got to stay in the channel. They actually have 10 pilots assigned to the Virginia to make sure they're going the right places. So as she comes out, it looks like she's heading towards Fort Monroe, but instead she turns and heads towards Newport News Point. Now, I gotta tell you, it's Saturday. It's the worst day in the US Navy. You know, many of the ships had uh, all the uh, underwear and stuff hanging from the yard arms drying. And so they're all sudden all these signal flags, the screw frigates get their steam up. And because Lewis Malshebras Goldsboro, the um, commander of the North Atlantic blockading squadron at the time and said, look, if that monster comes out, you just get all around her and you pound her into submission. Well, that's not going to work um, for various reasons. So the Virginia heads towards Newport News Point. It takes it an hour and a half to get from Sewell's Point to Newport News Point. Uh, let me have a slide, please. And it will uh, then go by Newport News Point where there's a little fort and in this slide, off to the left, that is the Congress. Well, as the Virginia goes past the Congress, the Congress fires a broadside at the Virginia. And I want to tell you, the shot bounced off the side of the Virginia like pebbles thrown against a brick wall. Oh my gosh, uh, you know, some of the gun crew, like on the forward seven inch brook gun commanded by Charles Carroll Sims, Everyone ducks and Sim says, be men, men. I've taken open shot in open air more than this. And everyone knew the shield worked. So they fired four shots at the Congress. Hot shot, and now I forgot to tell you that two of the nine inch Dahlgren guns have been fitted to fire hot shot. Cherry red shot that logs into a wooden ship and guess what happens? Voila, it burns. Plus explosive shells. Oh my gosh, this is terrible. Hot shot rumbled through, hit into right next to the magazine. Explosive shells critically injured the ship. Um, in fact, it was doomed at that gun, but Buchanan did not stop. Let me tell you, he wanted to attack the Cumberland because he understood that the Cumberland had a 70 pounder rifle gun on board. Now the 70 pounder gun is really not in the Naval inventory. So it was probably a 60 pounder Parrot rifle. And he says, that's the only gun that can damage my ship. So I want to sink that ship first. This guy, crazy, I got to tell you. And so the Virginia heads towards the Cumberland like some subhuman monster. Some people said she approached like a half-submerged crocodile intent on evil. Well, as the Virginia heads into the Cumberland, it will fire its forward gun <coughs> once, which decimates the gun crew of the rifled cannon. Then just as it rams, as you see right here, it will also fire another salvo into the Cumberland and the Cumberland shudders and immediately begins to sink. 
Now, remember I told you that the Virginia had bad engines. Well, let me tell you. When Buchanan orders the ship into reverse, guess what it doesn't do? It doesn't go into reverse. So it's stuck to the side of the Cumberland and the Cumberland is starting to take the Virginia down with her. As John Randolph Eggleston said, like a wasp, we could only sting once. E.A. Jack, third assistant engineer in the engine room, said, I felt our ship shudder when we hit the enemy vessel, but then I realized we took on a decidedly dangerous tilt. Well, what's going to happen is the ram breaks off. The Virginia floats about 50 yards away. We get different, some people say 50 feet, some people say 50 yards. And the two ships, even though the Cumberland is starting to sink, it's commanded by George Upham Morris. Oh my gosh. And so they keep firing at the Virginia. In fact, the Virginia suffered the most damage uh, during the two day battle from the Cumberland. They blew off two gun muzzles. Uh, they cracked a couple of plates. They perforated the smokestack so badly, according to Dinwiddie Phillips, that a flock of crows could fly through. Oh my gosh. But then the Cumberland will shudder and begin to slip beneath the waves. This is 3.30 in the afternoon. As George Upan Morris shouts to his crew, give him another broadside, boys, as we go. And the Cumberland went down with her flag flying. That moment, 3.30 on the afternoon of March 8th, is going to be the moment of change. This is where we prove the power of iron over wood. And as a result of that, we're not gonna build many more wooden ships. We're now focusing on iron craft. Well, the Virginia takes a half hour to turn around and head back towards the Cumberland. The Cumberland is run aground. It can only use its stern guns to fire at the Virginia. That's not very good. The Virginia gets within 100 yards and starts firing into the Congress. Fires break out. The commander of the uh, Congress, uh, Lieutenant Joseph Smith, uh, will uh, basically be killed by shell fragment. And they put up the white flag. You can't is now just excited. He's blood up. He gets up on top of the casemate and he orders, now there's some steamers, the James River Squadron with the Jamestown and uh, the Yorktown um, come down, right, to join with this fight. The, also the teaser, which is one gun armed tug, and also two armed tugs that are supporting the Virginia coming out of the Elizabeth River, the Beaufort and the Raleigh. The Beaufort goes alongside of the Congress to take off wounded, formally take the surrender, and then make sure the ship is going to burn. Well, according to William Parker, uh, commander of the Beaufort, he says, as soon as we got there, starting taking off the wounded, fire was unleashed against them from the shore. See, as the Virginia came around Newport News Point, a shell from the Beaufort actually went through the headquarters of the commander of Camp Butler, uh, Joseph King Fenno Mansfield, a graduate of West Point class of uh, 1819. And I gotta tell you, he's, he's mad as a hornet. So he says, fire on those ships. And some of his men said, well, they're under a white flag. We can't do that. And Mansfield says, I haven't surrendered, have I? So they pepper him with um, shot. Parker backs away from the Congress. Buchanan is up on top of the casemate. He's mad as a hornet. He tells a Marine to give him a musket and he starts shooting at the soldiers on the shore. Now, if you're a Union soldier on the shore, you just watch this monster sink two of the Union vessels, what might you do? That's right, they shoot Buchanan in the hip, grievously wounding him. He's brought down to the gun deck. Um, he shouts to the men, do not worry, men. The wound is not mortal. I will soon be back amongst you. Then he turns to his executive officer, Catesby up Roger Jones. Plug that ship full of hot shot. Plug her full of hot shot till she glows. And he gives that order knowing his brother, Thomas McKean Buchanan, is paymaster on board the Congress. 
So now the Virginia is going out of, see, the Congress of Cumberland are in the James River, so it comes back out into Hampton Roads. Now, what had happened in the meantime is that these other Union ships head towards the uh, um, uh, Newport News Point, and the big thing is, is that uh, the Minnesota runs aground on Newport News Bar. The Roanoke tries to take a wider tack. It runs aground on Middle Ground Shoal. And then the St. Lawrence is pulled by tugs, and it runs aground on Newport News Bar. Oh, my gosh, they're sitting ducks, but the tide is going out. Darkness is shrouding the battlefield. And with that, uh, they send shot into the St. Lawrence and the Minnesota. However, Catesby Jones, now in command of the ship, will decide they'll finish off the Union fleet tomorrow. Well, I'm going to talk more about the Monitor, I think, on December 30th. Let's also say the Monitor is this brainchild of John Erickson, the most unusual I've ever seen. Uh, in fact, the most strangest thing a sailor's eyes have ever looked upon. Uh, one officer, Charles Henry Davis, said, if I believed in idolatry, I'd take it out and worship it. However, he has a revolving turret with two 11-inch Dahlgren guns, and it is, it's only got six-inch freeboard, which is not good because it has to come down from New York to Hampton Roads. During that trip, she almost sinks twice and enters past Kate Charles. That's right, at five o'clock. She, uh, her commander, John Lomer Worden, sees in the distance, you know, flashes and sound of gunfire because he's 18 miles away from there. So as he comes in, he reports to the Roanoke, which has gotten off the, the middle ground shoal, now is anchored off of Fort Monroe. And the station commander is the captain of the Roanoke command, known as John Marsden, you know, naval hero. And he, uh, you know, word and reports to him. He says, "Look, I got a telegram from Marsden saying you to go up to um, the river to defend Washington. But I'm going to tell you right now that the best defense for Washington is stopping that monster." You position yourself next to the Minnesota and defender at all costs. Worden says, will do. Takes the monitor. Now, God, just remember, Hampton Roads, just uh, move the slides, please. Uh, Hampton Roads is like a amphitheater, number one. And you've got the Congress setting an eerie glow across the roads. And the monitor, which you see to the right, We'll pull up next to the Minnesota, a huge frigate. You know, the monitor is nine feet at the top of its turret off the water's edge. Uh, the Minnesota is 45 feet. So word hails the commander. The commander is Captain Gershon, um, Gershon Henry Jacques Van Brunt. Oh my gosh, been in the US Navy 45 years, a salty dog and word says, yeah, I'm, I'm the monitor. I'm here to protect you. And Ben Brunt looks down and goes, look, I don't know what you're going to do tomorrow, but if that thing comes back, I'm going to fight my ship and I'm going to fight it until I sink. Wow. So my word merely says, I will protect you. So the next day, as the Virginia comes out of its anchorage at Sewell's Point, um, they will head directly towards the Minnesota. They send a shot uh, uh, that screams through the rigging of the Minnesota. And then all of a sudden, they notice this tin can on a shingle, a cheese box on a raft. It looks like a barge. All of a sudden, it starts to head towards them and fires at them. Oh my gosh, Casey Jones knows exactly what that is because you see, the plans of the Monitor were published in the February edition of Scientific American Magazine. What does that mean? Well, Kate B. Jones has a copy of that, so he knows everything that ship can do. So what will happen is that uh, uh, right away, these two ships, the Virginia wants to get to the Minnesota and the Monitor wants to keep them away. So for four hours, these ships go in concentric circles, 
fighting each other. After an hour and a half, the monitor breaks off action to bring up ammunition from below. The turret's got to be turned in a certain place. Then what's going to happen is the Virginia heads towards the Minnesota and gets runs aground. Oh my gosh. The monitor comes up to the Virginia and pounds her. However, they aren't very direct with their shot. And actually part of the hull is shown at that point. And so they could have sunk the Virginia or they called it the Merrimack. They also misspelled it with a C, but that's okay. So what's gonna happen is, is that somehow those engines, they tie down the safety valves, they come off the mud bank and right away, Jones tries to ram the monitor. He, no one knows that the ram of the Virginia is stuck in the Cumberland. So he tries to ram it, the monitor takes evasive action and it just basically hits the monitor, but not hard enough. All that you see, the damage, are splinters from, you know, the, uh, the Virginia's um, forward. So what's going to happen is the monitor, Worden, knows he's got the wrong ammunition. He's got guns that are powerful, but he has to use half regulation powder charge. So he tries to ram the Virginia picks up speed, heads right towards the fantail of the Virginia because the Virginia has been using all this coal, all this gunpowder, all this shot. She's riding a little high in the water. You could actually see the propeller turning. So Warden says, I'm gonna ram that, I'm gonna disable her. Well, as she approached the uh, Virginia, the very last moment, there's a steering malfunction and the monitor glides past the stern of the Virginia, just as John Taylor Wood, commander of the seven inch stern brook gun, fires a shot that hits the pilot house, blows off part of the top, and blinds Worden. Worden falls out of the pilot house saying, I am killed, I am blind. And the monitor, the only guy on the monitor to receive a Medal of Honor was the quartermaster, or the, you know, he was at the wheel. He takes the monitor, pulls it onto a um, shoal, and then they have to run all the way up to the turret. So there's all sorts of trouble with the monitor, uh, which I don't have time to talk about, maybe another time. But yeah, they, uh, uh, number, number one, the speaking tube with the turret doesn't work. So they have to have runners going back from the pilot house, back up into the turret, say, fire at five points to starboard. Well, there are these white marks below the turret, but when you fire 11 inch Dahlgren with black powder, the white marks are obliterated. And furthermore, that um, the turret engine, since the, all the water that came onto the monitor, which almost sank coming down from New York, oh my gosh, the, the engine linkage gear had rusted already. And so they could start the turret, but they couldn't stop it. So it's spin around at 90 seconds. The only way if you're in the turret you can see is you look over the barrel of the 11 inch dog ring. So the monitor actually does very little damage to the Virginia, but with the blinding of Warden, um, the uh, moment of confusion, it takes about a half hour for Number one, to go up and get the executive officer of the monitor, Samuel Dana Green, bring him down. He asks Warden, what should I do? Warden says, look, I'm blinded. <laughs> you know, do everything you can. Be sure to save the Minnesota. Well, this is a half hour lapsing. KHP Jones now sees I've got my chance to get at the Minnesota, but the pilot's going, oh my gosh, the tide is going out. We got to go back to Elizabeth River. Um, we can't stay here. And so Jones turns his ironclad towards the Elizabeth River right as the monitor comes back into action. Both sides declare victory. Um, however, the Monitor won a victory because it stopped the Virginia from sinking any other wooden warships in Hampton Roads. The Virginia won the victory because it closed the James River to the use of the Union Navy right when 
Major General George Brenton McClellan is bringing his Army of Potomac, 121,500 men, down to Fort Monroe and Camp Butler. And now he can't see his idea is to march up the peninsula using the York River and the James River to guard his flanks and carry his supply. He knew he could capture Richmond. Well, without the use of the James River, his plans were thrown off kilter, so to speak. So for um, between uh, April 5th through uh, May 3rd, the Confederates are able to hold the Federal Army off thanks to the uh, brilliant maneuvers of Major General John Bankhead Magruder. I'll talk about him some other day. But the bottom line is the Union can't get around that flank. So the trouble is, is that Lincoln shows up in Hampton Roads, right? And by this time, the Confederates have retreated, fought the Battle of Williamsburg. Lincoln arrives on May 6th, 1862. He says, what's going on here? You know, he meets with the commander of Fort Mon or the Union Department of Virginia, 77-year-old Major General John Ellis Wool, veteran of the War of 1812, and the commander of the North Atlantic Blockade Squadron. Louis Mashibra's Goldsboro. Let me tell you, Goldsboro is five foot ten. He weighs three hundred and fifty pounds. He doesn't do anything quickly. In fact, he at one dinner consumed an entire chicken and bounced his stomach, saying, "Monsterly good." Well, anyway, so Lincoln says, "Why, why, why is the Virginia still over there? Why haven't we captured Norfolk? Why have we opened the James River?" And you know, um. Wool says, well, I want to capture Norfolk, but no one has let me do that. Goldsworth says, oh, what about the, you know, Virginia or the Merrimack, as he would have said. And so what happens is that as Lincoln goes through the fleet on uh, uh, May 7th, he talks to John, Commander John Rogers, who said, Look, we can attack Sewell's Point and we can send a force up the James River and attack those forts so that the Virginia has to make a decision, stop the attack on Norfolk or stop the attack on the Confederate forts. Either way, she's going to be isolated. So that's exactly what happens on May 8th, 1862. Lincoln watches it all from the small fort in the middle of the harbor, now known as Fort Wool. Um, and he sees the monitor come up. However, the Virginia, now commanded by Josiah Tattenall, a real hero in the mold of Nelson, he will bring the uh, Virginia toward the monitor. Actually, he says, men, we're gonna take the monitor, even if hell's on the other side of her, we will take her. You go to your stations, I'll go to mine. So he goes up on an easy chair on the top of the Virginia. God, the guy's crazy. And he actually had been in the U.S. Navy since 1812. So, And so when the monitor sees the Virginia come out, oh my gosh, they retreat. Lincoln throws his hat down. He's so angry. Um, and so he gets on a tug. He goes to what is called Ocean View, part of Norfolk. And there, he'll decide that's where we can land our troops. Wool will send uh, 6,000 men uh, uh, towards uh, Ocean View. The Confederates panic. They abandon Norfolk. They abandon the yard. They set the yard on fire. And they don't bother to tell Tattenall on the Virginia what they're doing. So when Tattenall woke up on the morning of May 10th, um, they see smoke coming from the Navy Yard. They don't see any troops at Sewell's Point Battery or Crane Island, Island Battery. And so what am I going to do? Well, Tattenall brings his officers together. He says, well, look, number one, we could go down game. We could attack the entire Union fleet, sink a couple of them. And if they sink us, it doesn't matter. Well, uh, you know, John Taylor would say, well, you know, if we um, get disabled, they'll capture us and that's terrible. So we can't do that. So Tattenall then says, I'm going to take her down to Savannah. <laughs> well, you know, you don't want to talk about an unseaworthy ship. Uh, she would be like a forlorn turtle. Any type of storm, she would have flipped. So 
The next thing is to lighten the Virginia. So throughout the afternoon and the evening of May 10th, they try to lighten her so that she can get down to 18 feet to get across what is known as the Harrison's Bar. Well, what's gonna happen? The pilots go up to Tattnall around two in the evening and says, oh, you know, I hate to tell you, but you know, the wind's in the wrong direction, blowing the water backwards across the bar. So you gotta get down another feet. Well, they can't do that. And now the Virginia is no longer an ironclad. So Tattnall will run the ship aground on Craney Island and the crew will eventually set the ship on fire. What a sad ending to such a fresh beginning, lamented one of her crew members, Richard Curtis. So in essence, the Virginia blows up. Lincoln actually is on Fort Monroe. He goes up to this Sebastian and he sees the Virginia blow up, right? And you know, the casemate turned red hot because of the, the flame and then finally got to the magazine. So it blew up. Um, Lincoln says, yeah, no, she had been a thorn in our side for such a long time, but now she is gone. And the U.S. Navy then is able to go into the James River, um, but they fail to reach Richmond, which is a whole nother story. I think I've almost gone too long, um, but uh, um, uh, I'll uh, talk about the Monitor uh, on uh, December 30th when I'm back here on Civil War Talk. And so, just like Buchanan told his men, I wanna remind you all to always sink before surrender. I'll now take questions. Okay. Question. Can you hear me? John, before yes. we take questions. Yes, uh, ma'am. I am going to introduce, uh, that was fantastic, by the way. Thanks. Uh, on the edge of my seat the whole time. Um, before we take the questions, we're, I'll read those questions for you out of the, um, the chat box in the order that people put them in. But I'm going to introduce Mike Kendra, who is the owner of CivilWarTalk.com, and Mike is going to share some information about the kinda. Uh -huh. No, I was on mute. Yeah, but this TV is on. You going to talk? Okay, I forgot about my side. Hey, thanks, Laura. All right, so let's see here. Uh, we have. There you go. All right. So thanks so much, John. That was a great presentation. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate you providing a presentation tonight. It's a good evening, everyone. And uh, I'm Mike Kendra. I'm the owner of CivilWarTalk.com. Tonight, Civil War Talk's hosting John V. Quarmstein, our guest presenter on Zoom. And this is a great opportunity to learn about another great uh, piece of American history. Uh, but Civil War Talk is much, much more than a weekly Zoom meeting. Although we have our share of everyday visitors who share stories and do research, we also have a large community of historians, reenactors, and students, and I would even say fanatics of the American Civil War. Many of us don't just read a story or two about the Civil War. We live and love to learn about the era. It's our passion. Uh, way back in 1999, and uh, you may have had to listen to those dial-up tones uh, when you tried to get on the World Wide Web. Uh, you probably used Netscape Navigator. The internet had things like Dancing Babies, and back then Google was still in beta. Uh, but also somewhere in there, Civil War Talk was born. Uh, today, we've grown into a modern community with over 24,000 members and over 115,000 different discussions about the war between the states. Membership in our community has always been free, and it's really easy to join, too. Uh, if you want to avoid those pesky Google advertisements on our site and also get a first shot at registering for our future Zoom meetings and other great perks, you can support Civil War Talk with a premium membership for as little as $12 a year you'll support our community and get lots of great perks. I wanna invite you to join our community today. And if you haven't already, you'll find stories that you'll cherish. You'll find knowledge that'll thrill, challenge and enlighten you. And you'll find friends that'll last a lifetime. Join Civil War Talk tonight. We hope to see you all in the community soon. Okay. It's Mike. Um... Mr. Corstein, if you're ready to get to those questions, we can uh, take some of them now. Dag, I'm right. Okay, let's see. 
I'm going to start at the beginning for from the very uh, starting of the program so that you'll, you'll be able to keep in mind what people might be asking. Um, let's see. Uh, if, you, if we want to buy John's book, what's the best place to buy it that benefits the most? And I think we're going to cover that in just a minute, but you can go ahead. Yeah, um, um, my books are carried, or all my naval history books are carried at the Mariner's Museum. So um, I think um, there's a website shown somewhere. Uh, so you go to that, go to the gift shop and say you want to buy a book, then they'll call me up and I'll go there and I'll sign the book to you. Uh, so uh, even if you're in Denmark, you can get a book. So uh, and I, I'm happy to sign them because I have to go to the museum. Uh, yeah, you know, every so often these days, but mostly I just do Zoom presentations. So uh, I got one Friday for the Mariners Museum. You know, so anyway. Uh, so that's a we'll share that. Books. Yeah, we'll share that one on Civil War Talk too. We'll share that uh, presentation so that people can join in that one. Um, let's see. John Butler wants to know: Did the Virginia ever get up rivers in North Carolina? No, it could not go anywhere, but pretty much into Hampton Roads. Um, she could go up the York River a little ways, a little ways up the James River. But um, no, she was, she had too great of a draft. She was 262 feet, nine inches in length. So she's unwieldy, 22 foot draft. You can't go down the Dismal Swamp Canal or the Chesapeake Albemarle Canal to get into, and then she couldn't operate in the North Carolina Sounds. So they end up having to build their own ironclads, such as uh, the CSS Albemarle, which is a fabulous story, so. Okay, let's see. Um, the next one is from Tina. She would like to know, why didn't the Federals immediately bombard the Gosport Naval Yard in 1862? Well, uh, because you, I got to tell you, um, McClellan, uh, as he's planning the Peninsula campaign, um, John Gross Bernard, who's chief engineer of the Army of the Potomac, says, well, you know, because that monster had already come out and sank those two wooden ships, battled the monitor to a draw, he says, we should go capture Norfolk. And if we do that, then the Virginia is not going to be there. We're going to be able to be in the James River as well as the York River. Well, it wasn't McClellan's idea to do that. He wanted to go and besiege Yorktown. He had brought all these great heavy guns. So he decides not to attack Norfolk first. Had he really had his thinking cap on, he would have attacked Norfolk because Norfolk on, had no defenses on the land side of any consequence. And so just as Abraham Lincoln and Wool and uh, uh, Mansfield all get together and uh, capture Norfolk, um, it could have been easily done. And then the Virginia, having no place to go, the end result would have been um, her destruction and opening the James River. Now that was told to McClellan three days after the battle by George, uh, um, John Gross Bernard, who's a West Pointer and, you know, a really brilliant engineer. And uh, so, um, you know, McClellan made a huge mistake there, primarily because of his ego. Okay. Okay, great. Uh, let's see. This is an interesting question from Mike. He wants to know, was $172,523 a good value for the Virginia with all the lack of seaworthiness, deep draft and terrible engine, did the CSA get a lemon? I'll tell you what, um, it was cheaper than rebuilding the Merrimack as a frigate to make her into an ironclad. So that cost was well spent by the Confederates. That ship defended Norfolk, that ship changed naval warfare forever, that ship sank um, actually, she destroyed two transports, captured another, sank the um, uh, Dragon, a armed tug, damaged the St. Lawrence, the Minnesota, damaged the Monitor. Well, let me tell you, it was a powerful warship. 
Was it worth the money? Well, if you compare the money spent on other ironclads elsewhere, like up in Richmond, uh, yeah, it was very worth the money. You know, uh, just think of the CSS Georgia and Savannah, and you can start to understand that thing could only go three knots. So it couldn't stem the tide. So, you know, that's, that's, uh, uh, so I think uh, considering the desire of Mallory to change, create a new class of warships, he was right on it and it was worth the money. Okay. Um, someone would like to know, did Buchanan and his brother both survive the war and did they reconcile afterwards? Um, no. Um, Buchanan recovers and he goes down to Mobile Bay, is promoted to Admiral and he'll fight Farragut uh, during the Battle of Mobile Bay, August 5th, 18. Uh, 64. Great story, which I'd love to tell on another time. However, um, his brother is shot by a sniper near Apicocha, Florida, on board the Pembina um, gunboat. So, um, so no, they didn't get to recon re reconciliate or anything like that. So it's a sad story, but, you know, I mean, uh, there are so many instances. This is one of the strongest instances of brother versus brother in the Civil War. Absolutely, what a great story. Um, so about Catesby and Roger Jones, um, somebody said he went on to run the sea, this is um, Richard, went on to run the naval operations at Selma and had a storied history. Can you expound on Catesby? Oh my gosh, she was a brilliant ordnance officer, Catesby App, Roger Jones. The App is a Welsh idiom saying son of, so he's Catesby, son of Roger Jones. Got you there, didn't I? And so, uh, you know, he was a brilliant officer, ordinance. He um, uh, had a, in fact, um, uh, one David Dixon Porter said, you know, all these officers resigned from the US Navy. And he said, the only two that we really cared about was John Mercer Brook and Kate's VF Roger Jones. So Jones, after being in command of the Virginia on March 9th, uh, he stayed executive officer. He went and fought at the Battle of Drury's Bluff on May 15, 1862. Then uh, because they needed to produce more Brook rifles, he will end up being in charge of the Selma Gun Factory. Uh, which produces the uh, Brook guns for the um, uh, Tennessee and for the Baltic and several other ships. So uh, um, he, he, he wanted to fight, but, you know, his talents were really in ordnance. And so he was put in the best place to support the Confederacy. After the war, I got to tell you, he joins a partnership trying to sell um, used military equipment to, you know, they're fighting down in South America, which was called the War of the Pacific. I call it the Guano War because they're fighting over these islands that have guano. So anyway, what's going to happen is he gets, he's down there in Selma. He gets in an argument with a neighbor and the neighbor shoots him dead. And uh, so, so ended the life of um, Catesby Ap or Roger Jones but not the history. Pardon? But not the history. The oh. UCV camp in Selma yeah. is the Gatsby camp, and this is an early ribbon from the mid-1890s from the UCV camp in Selma, named after him. He has a storied career. I mean, his work at Selma was phenomenal. I mean, if you think about creating a, basically a forge, building rifled cannon is a complex process. And what made Brook guns better than parrots is that Brook number one, uh, you know, cast the, um, the guns with a liner inside of it so that he would pull that out he then had a rifling machine to rifle it. And then he'd heat up the barrel again and put on bands. And some of his guns had two bands, 
Some had three bands. And that is probably one of the greatest things Jones did for the Confederacy, in my opinion. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean he lived so on he made, fact, he made a factory from nothing into a, um, you know, producing really needed guns for the Confederacy. Yes, he did. And he lived on in the Selma. He's buried in the cemetery in Selma. And there's still a SCV camp there by that name today. Yeah, he um, uh, actually he was, was in command of the Chattahoochee for a little while in 1863 before they decided to build the Selma gun factory. Um, uh, Jones uniform is at the uh, Confederate Naval Museum in Columbus, in Georgia. Columbus, yes, I've seen yeah. it many so, times. I've yes. been there, you know. Uh, so anyway, thank you for your question. You're welcome. Very cool. Um, uh, so the next question says, French Forest takes some blame for taking too long building the Virginia, but it seems like they were a lot of problems building an experimental new ship from derelict wreck that was raised from the muddy bottom of a river. Was the blame really valid or did he have a claim to command the Virginia as it said he desired to? Well, French Forest was, had more seniority uh, than any other naval officer. So by, by that, he felt he deserved to take command of the Virginia. Actually, French Forest did a great job getting the uh, yard back working. Um, the problem with the time it took to do the Virginia was not due to French Forest. It was due to the transportation systems bringing the iron plate down from Richmond. Sometimes they had to send it down to Weldon, North Carolina, take it off the rail car, put it on another one, and send it up to Portsmouth. So the delays are really um, not French Forest's fault. Now, I got to tell you, um, when the Virginia goes into dry dock afterwards, Mallory loses confidence. He thought that French Forest burned himself out getting the Virginia ready. He wasn't fast enough getting her repaired and completing the CSS uh, Richmond, uh, which was under construction in the yard. So what's going to happen is he gets placed in command of the Office of Order and Details, his office job, and in his place goes Sidney Smith Lee, who had been French Forest's executive officer, and he is the brother of another guy named Lee, known as Robert E. Lee. So um, French Forrest um, was an outstanding officer. His naval career is just outstanding. So I think uh, I think he's um, um, Mallory writes exactly why, uh, and he says, "You know, you just lost your head of steam. We got to get these ships ready and ready right away." Next. Awesome. Okay, uh, let's see. The next question is from Thomas, and he wants to know if Virginia knew the Monitor would be present the following day, is it safe to assume she would have destroyed or further disabled remaining Union ships? Um, all that the Confederates knew was that the Monitor was coming down, left New York on the afternoon of May 6th. That, or excuse me, March 6th. That's the very day that Buchanan wanted to come out of the list of the river and attack the Union ships. They, Confederates, knew that monitor was getting ready, as well as two other ironclads, the New Iron, New Ironsides and the Galena. So he was in a rush. But this terrible storm comes through Hampton Roads. It's the same storm that goes up and almost sinks the monitor. So he can't go out until March 8th. Um, many people think that um, Buchanan had a more aggressive form of leadership than Jones did. And so Buchanan's wounded, and he was actually badly wounded. It clipped his femur artery. Now, if any of you all have stench in your heart, they, they go right through there, and man, that hurts, um, you know? So I got seven stents in my heart, so I'm, I, I also I realized so that's how Buchanan felt. And uh, I kind of bonded a little more with Buchanan. Um, so the big thing is, is that um, Jones fights a technical battle. Um, and um, 
Uh, they come up with a couple of schemes during the battle. My favorite one is that John Taylor Wood goes to Catesby Jones and says, look, you know, our guns can't damage that because actually John Mercer Brooke had built or designed and fabricated armor piercing shot, the Brooke bolts. Oh my gosh, had they had them there, you know, there would have been some problem. Because when you look at the turret today, and I've touched the turret and you know, I was in charge of the monitor center with the, the GDs, you can see where a Brooke bolt screws into um, almost four layers of plate into the monitor's turret. And that's fired by a Brook gun 300 yards away uh, from where it hit the monitor. So uh, who knows what would happen? They just had the wrong ammunition. So uh, John Taylor Wiss says, look, I got this idea. Because remember, they've got the plans of the monitor. They know that the monitor has no small arms on board. So John Taylor says, John Taylor Wood says, look, what we're going to do is I got a bunch of volunteers. We're going to jump on board the uh, monitor. We're going to take off our peacocks. We're going to cover the uh, pilot house. We're going to take wedges and wedge the turret so it won't turn. And we got chloroform, which we're going to throw into the turret and we'll take her by boarding. Uh, John says, yes, sure. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, they didn't do that. Afterwards, you know, word in, when Worden is recovering, Lincoln goes and sees him and actually uh, Worden tells that this is a problem. They could have done this. And they actually, that was one of the plans they had that they had to fight the monitor again. So anyway. Wow, that's, that is an interesting uh, so plan wasn't. and an interesting story, right? Um, okay, this is going to be the last question we'll have time for tonight, but I was wondering if um, there's a few more questions in the log that we can't get to tonight. Would it be all right if we uh, post the questions from the chat box into the forum and then you could answer them there? As sure. We talk? Uh, we'd love for you to be a member. I will um, try to execute that action uh, in just a few moments. Okay, you know? great. All right, so here's our last question that we're going to uh, cover on here, and then John will answer the rest in the Civil War Talk Forum. Um, was Sims picked to be on the Virginia specifically because he had already served on the Merrimack with a K? Um, actually, you know, several. Jones served on it. Uh, um, um, Charles Carroll Sims served on it. Um, actually, John Randolph Eggleston comments as they go by the Congress, he says, I can't believe we were destroying my home for three years, the Congress. So, you know, this is a mixed up war. And uh, so, yes, uh, Ashton Ramsey was chief engineer on board the Merrimack, the K. Uh, and uh, so several other officers uh, were on board. So uh, the Merrimack, remember, the Union created two classes of ships, the Merrimack class of steam screw frigates, and then the Hartford class of steam screw sloops. And those were the most modern ships in the U.S. Navy when the war broke out. And uh, the frigates don't get the same amount of work as uh, do does the um, um, the sloops, because sloops took less track. Actually, I'm telling a story for the Mariners Museum on Friday uh, uh, about the USS Roanoke, because when the Merrimack is turned into the Virginia and comes out and sinks those ships, the Union goes, oh my gosh, we could take one of our steam screw frigates and turn it into something even better. Well, it's a three turreted ships, all center line. This is a massive ship. However, she's top heavy. She rolled. Um, you don't want to be in a storm on a ship like that. And so she stayed as a defensive ship in Hampton Roads. But the concept, the Roanoke concept is going to really be what nations start to build in the late 1870s and early 1880s. So. Anyway, I can't wait to hear that story. I'll have to tune in on Friday. We'll definitely list that one on the on the yeah. 
uh, forum so that everybody can join that one. And that'll be exciting. Uh, well, John, thank you again for joining us tonight and for answering all the questions. Um, just a reminder that all the presenters who appear on Civil War Talk Presents uh, do so without compensation. And in order to help, the, uh, help promote their books, we like to do this at the end. So I hope you don't mind, John. Um, I don't mind at all. <laughs> good. Well, at the Mariner's Museum, the other day I checked just to make sure these were in stock, and they are. So you can order these titles directly from the Mariner's Museum. Um, I'm sure Mr. Corstein would appreciate it if you would order them from there. Uh, and he, like he mentioned earlier, he'll be able to sign them if you order from there. Uh, this is the CSS Virginia Saint Before Surrender, which is the book that he spoke about tonight. Um, but he has nine, a total of 19 books, so 18 others besides the one that he spoke about tonight. And here are a few of those. Um, the Monitor Boys, the crew of the Union's first ironclad, actually won the 2012, I believe it was, Henry Adams Prize for Excellence in Liter uh, Historical Literature. And these titles are also available at the Mariner's Museum for immediate shipment. Um, and then I told Mr. Forstein ahead of time that I had to mention some of the other books unrelated to the war. So the Civil War along the Virginia Peninsula and my personal favorite, Yorktown Civil War Siege Drums along the Warwick. So my suggestion is to just go ahead and order all the ones that they have in stock and place your order tomorrow. Um, and Tina will enter the uh, link into the chat so that you can do that. Before we close, we always like to show you the upcoming programs that we have coming up for you. And I hope that you'll take a look at these. There's some really great ones coming up. We have next week, we'll have John Scales, the Battles and Campaign, uh, retired Brigadier, Brigadier General John Scales on the Battles and Campaigns of Confederate General Nathan Bedford Forrest. And then October 7th, Jan Kroon with The War Outside My Window. Uh, the Civil War Diary of Leroy Wiley Gresham. Lance Hurtigan on the Iron Brigade on October 14th. Neil P. Chatelaine on October 21st on Defending the Arteries of Rebellion, Confederate Naval Operations. Uh, and then Jerry Wooten, who sort of premiered last week on our program unexpectedly to promote his um, upcoming program on October 28th on Jacksonville. And it's actually almost the, that program will almost be an anniversary one also because it's happened on October 28th and the Johnsonville uh, battle happened on November 4th and 5th. So that'll be kind of exciting to have that happen then. Um, on November 4th, Scott Mingus on the Cumberland Valley Railroad in the Civil War. We've had a couple of requests for naval and railroad. So I think we're covering those, Mike. Um, in these upcoming programs. And then on November 11th, all the Gettysburg fans will be excited to know that we have um, George Kirk, I mean, Ron Kirkwood coming with the George Spangler Farm. December 2nd, Steve Norder uh, on the campaign to seize Norfolk and the destruction of the CSS Virginia. Imagine that. I and, know about that story. And, yeah, and then December 9th, we have uh, Christopher Loperfito on death disease. It's a medical program. The Civil War letters of Surgeon James D. Benton of the 111th and 98th New York. And then guess who's back on December 30th? John Forstein will be back on the sinking of the USS Monitor. And that's going to be on the anniversary, right? You want to tell yes, us a yes, quick indeed. teaser about that one? Uh, well, um, this is a great, I, actually, this program I take from Christmas Day because here they're having all these parties, you know, they're eating well, and all of a sudden they get orders to go down to Beaufort, North Carolina, because the U.S. Navy was planning to attack Wilmington, believe it or not, in early 63. Well, as soon as they got those orders, uh, Samuel Dana Green said, this is not an ocean-going vessel. So she's towed south by the Rhode Island and they hit this tremendous gale. And actually, um, part of my story is uh, dealing with um, Stephen Decatur Trenchard, the commander of the Rhode Island, who is the most famous rescue at sea person in the world at the time. 
and he's one of the reasons why many of the crew of the Virginia or the Monitor were saved. It's a really fascinating story, um, and uh, I think it is um, uh, just as exciting as the story just told. So, you know, what can I say? Um, well, we're really looking forward to it. We've been hearing about it ever since Mike set it up with you, and mm -hmm. for it to be that close to the anniversary, I think it's the anniversary of the sailing of the Monitor, is that right? Well, actually, on the 30th, um, the Monitor gets stuck in the storm and is okay. sinking, However, she doesn't sink until 1230 on the morning of December 31st. So you're, you're, had you been on the monitor at 830 on uh, December 30th, you might want to be somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, we're really looking forward to that one. And I hope that everybody will join us um, next week uh, on Wednesday at 830 with John, retired Brigadier General John R. Scales on the battles and campaigns of Confederate General Nathan Bedford Forrest. Um, and we will see you next Wednesday. Thanks for coming. Thank you all.